setting up. Good morning and Good morning. welcome to the worship. Uh, I think a polite request from the students. Uh, if you could all leave church in alphabetical order during the service, we can make sure the badges are in the right place on the table. <laughs> Consider research around there. Um, okay. We sing our opening chorus, remain seated. Such a love. Uh, if we can get churches together back 
money with someone who has been a... Anyway, so that was that. Um, now we have a council meeting, um, not Monday, but the following Monday. So if you have items that you'd like to bring to council, um, speak to a member of council. Uh, and on the 25th is a members meeting. So uh, you can ask, be sending out um, details about that. So if you want to join virtually, uh, we'll try and sort that one out. Um, preferably that we can have it in person here. Okay, um, I think that's everything. My learned friend. No, 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 that's on Tuesday. Uh, for those who go to the Old Norris, a reminder that it's an early start, half past one. It's a long film, South Pacific. Oh. If you haven't seen South Pacific, um, please show up. Okay, thank you. Let's join together in prayer. Oh God, you have touched our lives with your grace and your beauty showered upon us, whether we recognize your presence or not. You have come to us in Jesus, reaching through the centuries to show us that love cannot die and that your kingdom is among us. You keep coming to us through your spirit who dances around our lives, longing to catch us up that we may see the world through your eyes. You come to us and we turn to you to receive your gifts, to know your love and to join your dance of life. And then a prayer of confession. O oh God, we confess that we want to follow you, but get easily put off by the twists and turns of the journey. There are times when we are willing to carry the cross, but there are also many times when we want to lay it down and let someone else pick it up. We're willing to speak your word, but Sometimes do so quietly, so that it will not disturb anyone. Forgive us for our lack of trust in ourselves, in each other, and in you. Help us to learn how to reach out when we're struggling, and to open our hearts and minds enough to let you empower us. For however much we stumble, we want to walk with you. Amen. Amen. And we sing our first hymn, <laughs> Jesus is the Name.
first reading is from Romans chapter 13, verses 8 to 14. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbour, therefore love is fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it's already the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then throw off the works of darkness and put on the armour of light. Let us work decently as in the day, not in revelling and drunkenness, not in illicit sex and licentiousness, not in quarrelling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This is the word of the Lord. Said written by uh, Bessie Porterhead, who I gather for, for several years was secretary of the YWCA in Swansea. So some good things can come out of Swansea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's the hymn, O Breath of Life. Let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. 
Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be let loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. This is the word of the Lord. That was a thought of a sign. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rhys. Now, borrowing words from the first reading, Paul's letter to the Romans, I'm going to preach today about reveling and drunkenness, illicit sex, and licentiousness. <laughs> well, I'm not, but I've got your attention, haven't I? <laughs> Two weeks ago we were reminded of the turning point in Matthew's Gospel when Jesus challenged the disciples to say who they thought he was. Then last week's Gospel was a tough one as well. Jesus had started making clear what his fate would be. He began telling his followers that his end would be death and that most likely theirs would be too. And he issued that devastating challenge about taking up your cross in order to follow him. So that whole story was, was pretty serious. The kind of gospel that should make us sit up and take notice and realize that being a Christian isn't some sort of jolly, uh, sort of part-time hobby, a flight of fancy. It's a serious commitment to a, a radical new way of life. And this week's Gospel is just as challenging. It's a strange little passage that the, um, the lectionary provides for us. It's about disagreement within the Christian community. And if anybody's got a problem with that, I'll see you outside. <laughs> it's often helpful to look at what comes before and after uh, the passage we're looking at, to give it some sort of context. The whole of chapter 18 in Matthew's Gospel talks about our behaviour as God's people. In verse 1, the disciples ask Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he says, it's anyone who's like a little child. In fact, he says, unless you become like a child, you can't enter the kingdom. And worse, anyone who causes the downfall of a child would be better thrown into the sea and drowned. Then he told the parable of the lost sheep, you know, the shepherd goes off leaving 90, 99 on their own while he goes off to find the one that's lost. And today's passage follows directly after that parable. All of this concerns what our life as Christians should be like. The bottom line is we should look after one another and be honest with one another. But of course, that's not as easy as it sounds. And we know this, we often fail. Even in the, the best of circumstances, or more accurately, in what we know should be the best of circumstances. The history of the church is, is littered with examples where people fall out. Or sometimes, of course, there have been huge matters of doctrine uh, or theology that were involved. Even right back there in, in New Testament times, in, in the Acts of the Apostles, you've got that enormous controversy between those who followed Paul and those who followed Peter on the question of whether people needed to be Jews before they could become Christians or whether they could become Christians straight out. Fortunately, that was resolved amicably, and, and that's why we're here, because that particular one problem was knocked on the head. But not all disputes have been settled in the same way. We can find so many examples as you go through the history of the church that have resulted in divisions and 
schisms and sects and splinter groups and denominations and parties, people fall out. Sometimes over huge issues, but often about quite trivial things. Seems to be something about human nature. Forgive me for a moment or two if, if I sort of reveal something in my shady background as a Methodist. Yeah. And also throw in a bit of local history. We had a bit of Magna Carta last week, well, a bit of local history this week. The evangelical revival that began in the 18th century with the preaching of, of John Wesley and George Whitfield and, and so on had an enormous effect on not just on this country but, but across the world. It's sometimes forgotten that John Wesley was actually an, an ordained priest of the Church of England, uh, and really quite high church. He and his group of friends in Oxford tried to live as serious Christians, meeting regularly, studying the Bible, praying together, visiting prisons, helping the poor. And it wasn't until after John Wesley himself had had a particular experience that he described as that his heart was strangely warmed, a personal experience of Christ, that he began preaching about the absolute necessity of personal experience and the vital, the vital business of salvation through faith alone. But when he started doing that, he soon found that pulpits were, were barred to him. So he started preaching in churchyards and marketplaces, at pit heads, on open moorland, in assembly rooms and meeting places, wherever there were people who would gather. He said that this particular venture, moving into the, into, you know, out of the churches into the, uh, into the open, I consented to become more vile and proclaimed in the highways the glad tidings of salvation. He even preached here in Cambridge, a hundred yards away in the assembly room that's now a gym above Marley's Barbers. Uh, he preached there several times. First time he came, there was a crowd that gathered, a mob, whipped up by the local rector. I hope the new rector's not of it at the same hill. <laughs> whipped up by the local rector who, who drove him out of town. Probably to go and stay with some friends who, who lived at, in Fondmont Castle, Robert Jones. The real problem was not really that preaching was supposed to take place in a, in a consecrated setting, in a church. The problem was that people were being encouraged to take faith seriously. A challenge to a whole new way of life. The very label Methodist was pejorative. It was a, a sort of mocking nickname, poor Methodists. They were even marked off as enthusiasts. Their ultimate crime was that they were enthusiastic about their faith and they believed it could change the world. Well, put me down as an enthusiast. Anyway, something must have made a difference because when he visited again in 1749, he was able to write in his diary, I preached the next morning in Cowbridge. How has the scene changed since I was here last? Amid the madness of the people and the stones flying on every side, now all is calm. The whole town is in good humour and flock to hear the glad tidings of salvation. Uh, it's gone down a bit since then, but there we go. <laughs> Sometimes difference and, and, and division have to be explored. Not, not silly bits and pieces about whether women should wear hats in, in church or whether the clergy are wearing the right colour uh, vestments. But sometimes big things. Sometimes some critical issue that needs to be challenged by the searchlight of, of biblical scrutiny. But even that, in a sense, is a statement that, that underlines a difference. Do you take the, the, the Protestant approach 
of saying that the Bible is the supreme authority, or do you take the, the traditional Catholic approach, which says the interpretation of the Bible through the doctrine of the church is, is, the, is the right way? And what about our role in that as, uh, as reasonable, sentient human beings? Where do we come into it? I have a book on my shelves I've heard for many years now. It's a, an immensely detailed account of the life of John Wesley and the rise of Methodism written by Henry Rack. The title of the book is Reasonable Enthusiasts. Uh, I guess if I had to wear a label other than this one, uh, I'd be happy with reasonable enthusiasts. The gospel today challenges us to reconciliation, to resolving difference, that we should be building bridges, not walls. Jesus is addressing differences in the community of his followers. Just a little note at the side here. Uh, Matthew in, in, in this passage appears to have sort of made use of some words of Jesus in order to apply them to a situation in the early church in Jerusalem where Matthew was most involved. Since Jesus himself would not have made any reference to church. No such, no such creature at the time when Jesus was speaking. There was a community of his followers, but not a church. That developed as a notion later. Anyway, that's, that's an aside. Reconciliation. Because our actions have an impact not only on any person we've fallen out with, but on the whole community. Because we are the people of God, what we do affects the whole. We show that in the way we worship together as a community. That's why we baptize and confirm people as a community celebration. That's why we share a meal. That's why we do the confession together. That's why we pass the peace together. That's why we say we believe in one God and why our hymns say a lot of we and us rather than me and I. And Paul picks up that theme in his letter to the Christians in Rome. The commandments, the rules about how we should behave towards each other, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandments there might be are summed up in this one rule, love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbour. Love is the fulfilment of the law. I guess this, this is a message we need to keep on hearing in the church. Because we've so often got it wrong and have failed to provide a model of how people should live together. But my goodness, it's a message that our society needs. The society in which we, of which we're a part, needs to hear it again and again and again. How we long for peace in Ukraine or Palestine or Sudan or wherever. How we wish for an end to, to bitter political squabbling. How we want a solution for the problems that drive people in desperation from their homes. How we yearn for a socially just community in which all are treated fairly, whatever the colour of their skin, whatever their gender, whatever their back balance, whatever life opportunities they've had. Love your neighbour as yourself. What sublime idiocy. Love your neighbour as yourself. Ridiculous. Or just perhaps the answer to it all. We have to live it. And how's this for a starting point this morning? Where two or three come together in my name. I'm there.
Let's just be quiet together. Such love springs from eternity. Such love streaming through history. Such love, fountain of life to me. Oh Jesus, such love. Now we shall sing Choose a, a Charles Wesley hymn today, uh, even if it's not too well known to everyone. Uh, Christ from whom all blessings flow.
those who are the victims of storms, flood, droughts, famines, wildfires, especially where they're made worse or more frequent by climate change we have caused. We pray today for the people of Morocco following the disastrous earthquake and people of central Greece experiencing flooding. We pray for those who are ill and those who are dying. We remember at this time Graham and think of Sandra uh, in her concern for him. We think of uh, Nia Brown's mother-in-law who has died. In the name of Christ who healed those who were brought to him Loving God, we are our God. Let us pray for those who suffer through the selfishness of others, those who starve while others eat too well, those who are lonely while others are too busy to care, those who are neglected because their voice is small. In the name of Christ, who lived for others, loving God, we are our God. Let us pray for those who suffer because they love, for the bereaved and for those who are anxious about relatives and friends, for those who weep at the evils of the world, for those who deny themselves to give loving care. In the name of Christ who gave himself on the cross in obedience to love, loving God, yeah. Yeah. Let us pray for those who suffer because of their own actions, those who suffer guilt, whose lives are full of regret, those who despise the people they are, those who have made themselves unloving and unlovable. In the name of Christ, who pronounced the forgiveness of sins, loving God, hear our prayer. Lord, we rejoice that through the ages your saints have been prepared to suffer as they follow your way of love. We pray that we, encouraged by their faithful witness, may be ready to give all in the service of your eternal kingdom of love. In the name of Christ, who called for his disciples to take up the cross, loving God, hear our prayer. Lord, on the cross of Christ, we see you sharing in the suffering of your world. We rejoice to know that in our darkest hours, you are with us. And we commend into your love those whom we know who are suffering in any way. Amen. Amen. And we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And our closing hymn. Lord, for the years.
of the peace. So blessed. Grace, peace, and blessing from God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Rest and remain with each one of us now and always.